Hello, higher level physics students. Uh, this is the first video in topic 9.1. We're going to revisit simple harmonic motion. I know we studied this as a core topic with the standard level kids a while ago. What we're going to do in this topic in our higher level treatment is we're going to get um, in much more analytical detail and um, derive the mathematical models for simple harmonic motion. So it's quite a step up in terms of difficulty. I will also be using calculus in this section, which I know you guys can handle. Um, this video, the purpose of this video um, is to basically review some of the concepts of oscillations and to also review the idea of angular frequency. Turns out that that's going to be really central to your understanding of um, simple harmonic motion from an analytical point of view. Okay, So just to remind you what I mean by the term oscillation, it's any repetitive motion in time around a central or equilibrium value. And because it's repetitive, the motion has a pattern and is therefore periodic, okay? Therefore, it has a frequency, amplitude, and so forth, okay? Remember this condition for simple harmonic motion that we derived before. Well, actually, we didn't derive it. I basically just told you that's what it was. This is going to be the recurring theme in this section. And this is, in fact, the defining equation of simple harmonic motion. And I will uh, do some derivations of that later on, okay? So just to remind you of the different kinds of things in our universe that oscillate, so many different kinds of things oscillate. We've already looked at mass spring systems, okay? We've obviously looked at pendulums, even going back to last year uh, and the year before, okay? Ocean tides, remember, they oscillate up and down. They go up and down in a periodic fashion. Predator-prey cycles, geysers, of course, Old Faithful at Yellowstone, eclipsing binary star systems, even human heartbeats are periodic hopefully, right? Uh, business cycles, expansion, boom, bust, so forth, right? These are all periodic things, and they actually all oscillate. And so in all of these different sciences, whether it's biology or economics or medicine or um, geology or whatever, all of these disciplines actually use mathematical models to, to actually model these oscillations. And the models that they use are, um, are often simple harmonic motion models that we're going to derive in this class. So this is quite a universal concept in many different fields. It's not just physics, okay? Now, in, in, a, in a purely physics realm, we've talked about an example of an oscillation being balls rolling in a circular bowl, okay, a block of wood bobbing on a water surface, um, and most interestingly, in my opinion, the idea of a stick that's glued to a rotating wheel uh, with a light shining down on it. Um, and if you consider the, uh, the motion of the shadow going back and forth, it turns out that that motion is simple harmonic. Okay, and we'll, we'll do a little bit more with that. Now, of all of these, what we're going to study in the most detail, what you need to know, uh, really be an expert on in terms of the IV, are uh, pendulums and masses on springs. Okay, so I'm just going to do a little bit of review uh, on pendulums and masses on springs in this video. And um, I'm going to actually derive uh, the pendulum equation here, and I'm going to derive um, I'm going to derive a similar equation for a mass on a spring. Okay, so if you recall the simple pendulum, if I draw a free body diagram, if I consider the forces acting on a mass at the end of a string, okay, remember R is going to be the tension force, okay, mg is the weight, and what I'm doing is I'm basically breaking down the weight into component vectors where I have actually shifted my um, my coordinate plane, uh, my axes, um, in order so that the y, um, in order so that the y-axis is actually parallel, or actually is the actual string connecting uh, the roof here to the actual mass. Okay. Now, the force that's pushing the mass back to equilibrium is actually this component of the weight, right? Okay. This is mg sine theta. It's actually negative mg sine theta because it's pointed to the left, okay? And since that's a force, that's mass times acceleration by Newton's second law. So um, the acceleration is negative g sine theta. Now, the distance along the arc from the equilibrium position, okay? The arc is actually not drawn here, but if you can imagine here, let me see if I can draw it with this somewhat lame pen, okay? Uh, the pendulum goes like that, right? Okay, the distance along this arc right here is actually L times theta, right? Where X is L times theta, right? Remember um, the uh, equation for an arc length, okay? So theta equals X over L, then A equals negative G sine of 
uh, x over L. Okay. Now we're going to use that small angle approximation here again, and this is why when we talked about pendulums before and the pendulum equation, um, this is why we said that the pendulum equation only holds for small uh, initial angles from the equilibrium or from the vertical. Okay. It's because we have to use a small angle approximation. All right. Um, if x is small compared to L, in other words, if that if that little arc length is small compared to L then the sine of x over L is equal to x over L, as we've seen before in class. So now we have that A equals negative G x over L, or in other words, G equals negative omega squared x, okay? Um, now, this negative omega squared, I'm going to talk a little bit more about where that comes from. This will be integral in terms of determining uh, dealing with the equations of motion, uh, um, sorry, the uh, equations of simple harmonic motion. Um, omega is no more than the angular frequency, okay? So it's 2 pi over the period, okay? Now, in this case, um, omega squared is g over L, okay? And again, uh, as I just said, that's 2 pi over t squared, okay? So if we solve for t, we end up with 2 pi times the square root of L over g. Again, I think probably the thing that you might be struggling with with this derivation would be the fact that I seemingly pulled out this omega squared term, this omega term, out of a hat, okay? And you're not really quite sure where that hat came from or where that term came from. It turns out that A equals negative omega squared x is the defining equation of simple harmonic motion. Remember that A is proportional to negative x. That constant of proportionality is what we call omega squared, and I'll revisit that later, okay? Now, I have to point out that this strictly is not simple harmonic motion because the acceleration is not proportional to the displacement. However, the simplifying assumption when x is small compared to L, it actually is simple harmonic motion, okay? The other thing is, um, you know that there's centripetal forces acting and all kinds of other things going on with the pendulum, so this is a simplifying assumption, okay? Now let me talk about the mass on a spring for a little bit, okay? In the vertical, you know that gravity plays a central role in stretching the string vertically from its un, um, unstrained or equilibrium position, all right? When the mass is attached to the spring, the spring stretches until a new equilibrium position is reached. Um, if the spring is pushed up further a distance and then released, the following motion graph would be obtained, right? And I think we've gone through this slide before. In this particular case, A is 2 centimeters. Uh, the period is 60 milliseconds, and the frequency is 0.17 hertz. You should be able to ascertain all of that from a basic displacement time motion graph, okay? All right, if you remember Hooke's law, okay, uh, we had that F is proportional to the negative displacement. That's the equation, that's an equation of simple harmonic motion. But Hooke's law specifically, before we ever even learned about simple harmonic motion, we had studied Hooke's law even uh, in the first year of the IB. And we found that the restoring force in a spring is equal to negative k times its displacement, where k was that thing called the spring constant, which was uh, really, uh, really sort of quantified how stiff or how loose a particular string our spring was. Now, if we equate that to um, to m a, which is Newton's second law, where a, uh, acceleration is a function of time, I can rearrange this, and I can have that a equals negative k over m times s of t, okay? Now, in this case, uh, recognize that this term right here is omega squared, again, as it was last time, okay? f of t is called the restoring force or spring force. The minus sign means that f always points in the direction opposite to the displacement. You know that. If you consider a spring on a frictionless tabletop, it's the same thing, okay? Right? And we've gone through this diagram before and this diagram before with a moving paper and a pen and all that kind of stuff, okay? All right, so A of T is negative K over M times S times S of T. If I let omega squared equals K over M or omega equals root K over M, which takes, a, takes care of that negative sign, I have A of T equals negative omega squared S of T, okay? And you know from your studies before that there's a maximum, um, maximum velocity in the middle, maximum acceleration at the edges where the maximum displacement occurs. So this means that since omega is 2 pi over t, which is 2 pi f, equal, equals the square root of k over m as defined up here, I can actually come up with an expression for the frequency by rearranging and isolating f. f is 1 over 2 pi root k over m, and this in fact is one of the equations that's given to you in your data booklet. Okay, so. This equation is given to you for the mass on a spring. The pendulum equation that I derived two, uh, three slides ago is also given to you. This is where it comes from. Again, possibly the most 
uh, mysterious thing to this for you is this omega squared term. Accept that for now and you'll see where it comes from when I derive the equations of simple harmonic motion later. Okay? Okay. Anyway, this is the equation relating F, K, and M for a mass on a spring oscillating vertically or horizontally. Okay, it's the same thing, same thing. Okay, I want to talk very, very briefly. This won't take long because I know that many of you, hopefully all of you, are still pretty good with radians, even though we haven't dealt with them in a while. Okay, um, if you remember radians from our study of circular motion, a radian is just another unit of measure that uh, quantifies an angle instead of degrees. Okay, so we had 0, pi over 6 pi over 3, pi over 4 would be 45 degrees, and then we go all the way around the circle as such. You need to be super, super comfortable with all of these. Remember that 0 and 2 pi are actually the same angle. When we deal with simple harmonic motion, um, all the angles that we deal with are going to be in radians, so you're really going to um, you're really gonna have to be pretty tight with this, okay? And I also want to remind you how circular motion was intimately related to periodic motion, and this particular um, Illustration here really, really shows it best, I think, okay? Uh, we, we've talked about how the shadow goes back and forth, maximum acceleration on the edges, um, minimum acceleration in the middle, and so forth, right? And the actual shadow is, is being created by the fact that there's circular motion occurring, okay? A is proportional to negative S again and again and again and again, okay? We noted that the velocity of the shadow is also zero at the ends and highest in the middle, okay? And we can actually then... Think about this as on, on a graph as a sinusoidal curve, okay? And remember, the only thing, the only difference between the sine and the cosine is a phase shift, okay? And they're out of phase by pi over 2, as you know. This is all old, sort of old hat for you guys, all right? Important for you to understand how sine and cosine functions can be graphed. We don't really deal in this class with tangent functions. Tangent functions don't really represent or model uh, any sort of physical phenomenon that we're interested in in this class, okay? So we're only dealing with sinusoidal functions, all right? Now, if you remember circular motion, okay, we had an object moving in a circle of radius r at a constant speed v, okay, and we said that the time to complete one revolution we called the period, and that's, that variable is capital T. If this object, which in this case is a little um, red sphere, if it covers a distance c equals 2 pi r, which is the circumference in a time t, then v equals 2 pi r over t, okay? And if I rearrange this, I have t equals 2 pi r over v, or 2 pi r omega r, okay, where I'm introducing this new term. We've already been through this. Uh, this is called the angular velocity, okay? It's the, it's the number of radians that the object um, subtends or extends in one complete period, right? Okay, so the units would be radians per second, or usually we just say hertz or per second, it's angular velocity, okay? Another way to think about it is that um, in a time, capital T, that's the, that's the angle that the ball actually sweeps out, right? Okay, now, since the frequency... Uh, is 1 over the period, or f equals 1 over t, we can also say that omega equals 2 pi f. And if you think about it in this term, we would actually refer to it as the angular frequency instead of the angular velocity. Really, the two of them are the same. They both have the same units, uh, 1 over seconds or hertz. But um, just, just be aware of that term, uh, angular frequency referring to 2 pi f, and angular velocity mean, uh, referring to 2 pi over capital T. Okay?